The biggest drills cannot drive the biggest screws, and electronic drill clutches are two-dimensional. These drills have very different internal mechanisms to rotate a drill bit or a screw bit, and today we're taking a look inside with a high-speed camera to see exactly why these tools are good at certain things and bad at others. The tools have been supplied free of charge by Festool, the camera has been supplied by Cron Technologies, I don't have to say anything about them. Regular drills have different gears to go fast with a little bit of power or slow with that oomph. This makes them great for all the things that require different speeds and different amount of torque. For drilling small holes in wood you want high speeds, but with a big auger bit you mostly need a lot of power. <laughs> ah, <no. laughs> Too much for this small drill, but funnily enough a regular spade bit needs mostly speed again, and it could do that perfectly fine, even in the Azobi wood. Nice. For steel you want to go relatively slow and press hard, then you can get nice chips like this. Otherwise you heat up the drill bit too much and it dulls very quickly. Bricks are tough with a regular masonry bit on a regular drill, as they have an insanely negative rake angle, so they just glide over the brick without doing much. But you can also get these masonry bits that have a sharp edge, and that actually works quite well. Nice. Very good. But as soon as you touch any type of concrete, a regular drill will fall flat on its face. It simply doesn't do it. We were at a local gravestone manufacturer for this piece of granite, and we even tried the exact drill bits they recommended, but no luck. Drills use planetary gears, and they are just pure magic. I'm very glad that I finally get to talk about them. We have the sun gear in the middle, on the motor that drives the system in this case. Then the planet gears, with the planet carrier that holds them, and the fixed ring gear. And then the rotation of the planet carrier is put into another set of planetary gears, but this is where the magic happens. The ring gear on this stage can lock the planet gears to the planet carrier and rotate with them, so the whole thing turns as one at the output speed of the first stage. Or the second ring gear can be locked in place, like the first one, while the planet carrier is let go. Then it acts as another gear reduction. This drill even has four speeds, and that's simply done by adding another stage in front of it with a different gearing ratio. For example, the first stage might turn one rotation of the motor into three quarters of a rotation when it's engaged, while the second stage will turn one rotation into half a rotation when it's engaged. So you can do one rotation turns into one rotation when both of them are disengaged. You can turn one rotation into three quarters when the first is on, or it turns into half a rotation when only the second one is engaged. And finally, when you engage them both, you get three eighths of a rotation of the drill per full rotation of the motor. This is just an example with some simple numbers, of course. The real reductions will look different. And the second stage is operated with a cam slot like this. By moving sideways you actually move another ring gear forwards or backwards too. A nice little detail is that these gear switches often have a spring. Either the metal that holds the ring gear is a spring itself, or there's a spring built into the mechanism somewhere to make sure that even when the teeth can't mash you can still switch gears and then as soon as the motor starts to move it clicks into place. The actual click that you feel happens at the switch itself. These gears are usually made from sintered metal powder. Complex shapes like this are relatively expensive to machine, so what they do is that they put metal powder in a mold and press it together very hard, then heat it for a while just under the melting temperature and all the metal grains will fuse together. This makes it much cheaper to make, and although forged and machine gears will be stronger, these powder metal gears are actually pretty nice, as they are still hard as nails, and their slight porosity can actually help with lubrication. The gears in these festivals are all metal as far as I've seen, but on some drills there are plastic ring gears, and that sounds like a terrible idea, because plastic has a terrible name, and it's associated with cheap, low quality toys. But Plastic gears are not as bad as you might think. When the load is low, plastics can actually be more wear resistant than metals. They are not as strong, but super slippery. And if you look at how much leverage this gear has on the motor, the actual power that the gear sees is pretty low. And then take into account that the power is spread over three gears. 
And don't get me wrong, metal gears are much better, but if you have a light load and you can manage to keep them cool, which is the sticking point of course, plastic gears are not the end of the world at all. Another thing that regular drills have that impact drivers or rotary hammers don't is a clutch. These wheels with all the numbers. It helps you to stop in time and not strip out the screws or the wood they bite into. It can also help you not to put in the screws too deep on drywall, for example, as the strength on drywall comes from the paper, so you don't want to tear it. Anyway, there's two kinds of clutches. There's mechanical clutches. They have some balls that ride in a groove that has some bumps in it and these balls are pressed into the groove with a spring. So the tighter you turn this spring, the more force it takes to get over these bumps. When you put it into drill mode, the nut contacts the washer behind the balls so they can't move back at all. Then there are electronic clutches. When you put this drill in the lowest clutch setting and its slowest gear and then try to drill one of these tiny screws, it strips out the wood immediately. And there we go, strips out. Because this is an electronic stop, it doesn't measure it here, it measures the power that the motor is making. So if there's gears in between, um, four might actually be much weaker. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nothing. On this piece of oak, I tried every setting until it stripped out the wood. And you can see that in the first gear, it strips out this size of screw almost immediately. Well, in the fourth gear, you have endless precision. So this is very strange because it means that you need to use a fast gear for small screws. I don't think that's great. However, in my limited testing, it does seem to work fast enough so you don't have to really worry about like it going too far and it has the added benefit that you can be super precise on small screws in high gear and on big screws in a low gear well with a regular clutch you often have like one maybe two settings that might or might not be quite right electronic clutches also have no moving parts and weigh practically nothing they'll take some getting used to but i think they'll be on all drills sooner or later now Moving on to the combination drills, hammer drills or percussion drills, however you want to call them. They all use the same mechanism. If you buy a cheap corded hammer drill like this, it might not have gears, no clutch, sometimes the trigger is even just an on-off switch, and as I will get into, the hammer mechanism is shit. So I would never recommend these. However, combination drills like this have their place, I guess, because they still have the clutch and the gears. They're just a bit more cumbersome because you're always carrying around the extra failure points and the extra weight for the few masonry holes that you might need to make every other year and then it can be quite bad at that too. Look, the mechanism inside is just a few pieces of bumpy metal that rub past each other. It pushes the drill back and then lets you slam it into the drill bit basically. Although slam might be a bit of an overstatement, it's just a tiny tickle. By rotating this piece of metal, you can engage or disengage it. It works fine for small holes in brick, but it really struggles with small holes in concrete. I mean, it works, but it doesn't like it. Oh, it's blue. Wow. I wouldn't want to do more than 10 small holes in concrete with a hammer drill and I'd make sure to dip the drill bit in water every few seconds. And bigger holes in concrete for a water line or something? Absolutely forget it. No chance. It's not gonna happen. I tried to see if this can be remedied by diamond drill bits for example. A tile drill for small holes and a diamond core drill that's supposed to be able to cut dry. But even with light pressure as the packaging said, they both dulled before I could get very far. This was done without hammering, of course. I'd only ever recommend getting a combination drill if you're only ever planning on getting a single drill. In contrast to these hammer drills, which are drills that can hammer a little bit, rotary hammers are actually hammers that can rotate a little bit, and that's what you want for concrete and harder stones. These ones can drill small holes in concrete all day long, and they can be used for bigger holes for water lines and that kind of stuff. They generally don't have different gears, so they struggle to make a lot of torque. Right. As I showed in the beginning, they often can't drive a big screw. Hey, that's interesting. And that's not something specific to these battery powered ones. Even this absolute unit of an arm twister that only goes clockwise at full speed. Doesn't like that. Same for cutting a big hole in hardwood with an auger bit. 
doesn't want to do it. It doesn't have gears, so it doesn't have power, and it doesn't work for these types of things. Sometimes these machines are also called pneumatic hammers, even though they don't work on compressed air or anything like that. That's because of the mechanism inside. After some gear reduction, there is a shaft with what's basically an angled ball bearing. When the shaft rotates, the bearing wobbles back and forth. And because it's a bearing, you can hold the outer rays still. And voila, you have turned rotation into reciprocation. You might think to connect this to a little hammer and done, but that would be a big mistake, because this motion always follows the same path without any option to deviate from it. So if the drill bit is pushed in inwards too far, the hammer would just stop. So instead, this reciprocation motion moves a cylinder that's closed on one end, and in that cylinder is a free floating piston that acts like the hammer. It rams the anvil, and then it's able to stay still while the cylinder still moves forward a little bit. These machines often have a bit of vibration isolation going on. It's kind of funny. In this case, it's just not connected at the top, and it uses the flex in the housing itself as a spring. Everything is a spring after all. This is a perfectly valid zero part solution. It's not quite zero parts, of course, but you get what I mean. Then, finally, we have the impact driver. It's an amazingly elegant design. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with them because they are so incredibly noisy. You should never ever use these without hearing protection. But they do everything and do it with like half the parts of a regular drill. They drive the biggest screws you can find and they do it without twisting off your arm, I might add. Then, they also rotate super quickly. They are quite precise, they are light, they don't need gears, they don't need a clutch. It's really something else. Let's take a look inside. It's super simple. There is a fixed planetary gear reduction, and then it goes straight into the shaft that's connected to the hammer in an interesting way. There's these two ball bearings that ride in opposing U-shaped grooves in the shaft and the hammer. And there is a spring on the back of the hammer that pushes it forwards. But when the hammer is stopped, the shaft keeps rotating and the U-shaped grooves move the anvil back. You can see it here on the inside. It then jumps over the dogs on the anvil to which the bit is connected and slams into the next dog. So when there's no resistance, it's fast. And when there's more torque required, it automatically starts hammering. Impact drivers are best for driving screws and stuff, partly because they generate so much torque in short bursts. And because it does so in an instant, it pushes against its own inertia so it doesn't take a whole lot of torque on your wrist. And these short bursts, against its own inertia, also help with not camming out on Phillips fastener and the like, without having to push so hard. It slams the screw, and it's done already before the machine can start to move backwards to cam out. Although it still happens, of course, and Phillips and Posey drives are still shitty screw types, don't get me wrong. I mean can still come out. Impact drivers don't have a clutch, so they might not be great for very small screws, even though you can move slowly. As you can see, the anvil doesn't make the full jump at slow speeds, so it's really the power that you put through the motor that determines the intensity of the hammer hit, not the power of the spring. It's also just the power of the motor at higher speeds, where you might think that the acceleration that the hammer gets from the spring is added to that of the motor. But they're in series, right? The motor is connected to the shaft and a shaft to the hammer, so the spring pushes back against the motor to accelerate the hammer, so sadly there's no free lunch this time. Impact drivers are also fine for drilling. Wood, no problem. Even the big auger in hardwood, easy. Steel, also fine, although I can imagine that if your drill bit is even slightly dull, it doesn't bite, and you'll just spin it very fast and burn it up. I wanted to try and see if this hammering action would do something on stone. It also moves forward a little bit after all. And on brick it kind of worked, but on concrete I couldn't get the friction that was needed to start hitting, so the drill just spun very fast and that was it. It failed the test in a way that I hadn't considered at all, and that's always very refreshing. It's kind of tricky to engineer one of these things, because, well, you have to get the harmonics right, which are notoriously hard to model. You want the hammer to exactly hit the anvil full on, and for a single speed that would be easy, but we want optimal behavior at every speed. Some brands struggle with that. The Talk Test channel has a great video showing that, which I'll link below. One of the best parts of impact drivers is their chuck, in my opinion. 
opinion, it's a shaft with a hex hole and some bearing balls that grab onto the little groove in hex bit. And by pulling the foreskin, it releases the bit. It's super quick, super easy, super light, almost no parts, no grip strength needed. I really like this. SDS chucks on these rotary hammers are kind of similar, just for a different, more specific shape, which is less elegant if you ask me, but it is what it is. Regular keyless chuck like this are very flexible. The fact that you can quickly chuck in an Allen key or whatever really comes in clutch sometimes, but they're actually surprisingly complex. At the face of it, it's just a nut with three jaws that have teeth on them. However, the drill can spin, and you can't fasten something when the drill just spins with you, and that's where this whole contraption comes in. It's four bearing pins on a sloppy drive mechanism. In the machine, there's a stationary ring around here, and when the power comes from the motor, the outer wall rolls the pins into the middle of these flat spots where they have some space. But when the power comes from the chuck, the slop in the mechanism changes the geometry in such a way that the cylinders are rolled onto the corners of these flat spots instead, where they jam up against the stationary ring, preventing the shaft from spinning when some monkey hands crank the chuck down. Then let's look at some general things I came across. First, the housing is plastic, ah, plastic, but it's nylon with 30% glass fiber. This is the good stuff. You can hear the glass fiber when you cut it. It makes it a bit stronger, but also much more dimensionally stable, so the castings actually fit together nicely. And by adding these glass fibers, it becomes a bit more heat resistant. You're also basically sandblasting the inside of your mold though when you cast it, so it becomes a bit more expensive because you wear out your molds much quicker. But I mean, it's not for nothing that every tool brand uses it, even the most premium ones. Regular switches are literally just metal contacts sliding over some carbon strips, which is super sensitive to dust and water. But these tools have magnetic sensors and magnets in the trigger and the direction switch. This doesn't care at all about dust or water, and it will basically last forever. I like this a lot. This o-ring on the fast tool does look like foam though, I'm not a big fan of that. These days the electronics are usually all nicely epoxied in drills like this, called potting, increasing resistance against dust, vibration and water attacks, while keeping all the cable connections accessible so parts can be replaced. I think these types of solutions with the epoxy are really funny. At some point someone was like, if I just pour a whole bottle of glue on top of this PCB, it might actually solve all my problems. And of course it didn't work the first time, right? Because you still have to get the heat out and a whole lot of problems I probably don't even know about. Don't underestimate the wit, the smarts, the creativity that's needed to come up with a working solution like this. This person was a real problem solver who made things better and longer lasting for everyone. And since you made it this far into the video, I think you have it in you to be one too. With Brilliant, the sponsor of this video, on Brilliant, some concepts will just click in ways that actually allows you to use them in new contexts. I always love to do some warm-ups for the scientific thinking course and last week it was like balancing these mobiles and I am certain that I will use these concepts at some point when I'm counterbalancing some kind of spinnamabob or some kind of thingamajig. Look, I'm already on a 257 day streak. Brilliant can make you excel in the topics of your choice with visual interactive problem solving. You know how much that aligns with what I do and what I stand for. If you're curious, you can use the link below or scan a QR code on screen to learn for free on Brilliant for a full 30 days. They will also give you 20% off an annual premium subscription. Which which gives you unlimited daily access to everything. Your homework for this video is to take a look inside one of your power tools or kitchen appliances and send a picture in the Discord chat with one of your findings. I hope to see you in the next video.